how can we know, uh, let's say philosophically, because I know there are scientific ways and philosophical ways to look at this. Philosophically speaking, how, how can we uh, make that assertion that the universe began to exist? I do think that the second premise is the most controversial premise in the argument, and therefore the one to which I've devoted the most attention. Uh, historically, the second premise that the universe began to exist was supported by philosophical arguments. It wasn't until the 20th century that there was any sort of empirical evidence for the beginning of the universe. And as I looked at the various arguments that were offered historically for the beginning of uh, the universe, the finitude of the past, it seemed to me that two of them stood out. Uh, one would be the argument based on the impossibility of an actually infinite number of things in reality. And then the other would be the impossibility of forming an actually infinite collection of things by successive addition. Um, these arguments are independent of each other. Even if one fails, the other could still be sound. And so together, I think they provide very persuasive philosophical grounds for affirming the finitude of the past and hence the beginning of the universe. Sure. So let's think about this. Uh, the difference between an actual and a potential infinite, which is the crucial mm. distinction to make, um, yes. as far as I understand it, is that uh, an actual infinite is kind of what it says on the tin. It's, it's, it's a, an actually existing infinite number of things, as it were, that actually exist in reality, whereas a potential infinite is something that can tend towards infinity, such as dividing the space between uh, two points on a ruler. You can divide that infinitely, uh, but that doesn't mean that there are actually an infinite number of things between each point. Is that a fair analysis? That's, oh, that's exactly right, Alex. And the concept of the potential infinite dominated Western mathematics and philosophy until the 19th century, when uh, Georg Kantor, a German mathematician, discovered the concept of the actual infinite. So the notion of, the, of a potential infinite plays its role in calculus, where we think of infinity as a limit, which a process approaches but never arrives at, whereas the notion of the actual infinite finds its application in infinite set theory, where mathematicians talk about sets that have an actually infinite number of members in them. And it is absolutely crucial to distinguish these because one is not denying that the potential infinite can exist. Uh, the denial is that there can be an actual infinite in the real world. Sure. So there are two objections that to me can be derived from this idea of the distinction between the potential and actual infinite. Uh, infinite. And the first is this. There's an argument to be made that potential infinites in some way assume the existence of actual infinites. For example, mm -hmm. people think that if a potential infinite is something like uh, two spaces, the space between two objects being infinitely divisible, that there are somehow an infinite number of divisions between those two points. And so although it's like, although when you do the divisions, it tends towards infinity, the number of actual divisions, the number of halfway points or something like that, is an actually infinite number of things. So it, that would imply that actual infinites do exist in between any two spaces. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is that it is guilty of a modal operator shift. Uh, it is true that possibly a line is divided here and here and here and here uh, ad infinitum. But it doesn't follow that there is a place here and here and here and here where the line is possibly divided. That's mm -hmm. two different claims. And um, I would say that a line is not a composition of points, that the line is logically prior to any points that you specify right. on it. And that therefore the um, possibility of potentially infinite processes does not imply an actually infinite number of points. To assume that a line is a composition of points is to already beg the question in favor of the existence of an actually infinite number of things. Sure. So uh, to flesh this out, let, let's think of a more concrete example. Um, 
I'm thinking of the example of this paradox of the light bulb, which you, you've probably come across. This, this, is, this is how I'm kind of understanding the objection in its most strong form. You can imagine uh, some kind of uh, light bulb that, that is programmed to switch on and off at particular intervals. And it's programmed such that you have a length of time, let's say, you know, 10 minutes, that once half the remaining time has elapsed, the switch gets hit, right? So, so it starts off and halfway between the kind of time elapsing, the, the light bulb gets turned on. And then halfway between the remaining time, it gets turned off. And halfway between the remaining time, then it gets turned off. Uh, and obviously the on and off switch is increasing in speed in terms of how quickly it's going on and off. Now, the reason that this is an interesting point to raise is that by the time the actual time has elapsed, it seems that you actually have a, a, a substantiation, a, a thing that has actually happened an infinite number of times. And we have to answer the question of whether the light bulb would be on and off at the end of the question. But the, the kind of real question, the, the real interesting part is relevant to this discussion, is that if you had such a programmed light bulb, it would seem not just that you've kind of got a potentially divisible, uh, potentially infinitely divisible right. space, but that an actual infinite number of things has happened in a finite amount of time. Yes, this is a paradox known as Thompson's lamp after the author who invented it. And the question that Thompson was raising is, at the end of the process, will the light be on or off? And there's no answer to that question uh, because there is no causally prior state immediately prior to the final state of the lamp after it's gone through the process. Mm -hmm. And so my argument would be that Thompson's lamp is absurd, that it, it cannot exist because the, there will be a causal gap between the states of the lamp in the series of switchings and the state of the lamp after the switchings are complete. There is no immediate causally connected state prior to that last state. Uh, and, and therefore, the state of the lamp at that last state would be literally uncaused, which I think is metaphysically absurd. Sure. So from this, are we supposed to take that uh, the lamp couldn't be programmed in such a way? I mean, it, it seems like right. it doesn't break any kind of, uh, on the surface, I mean, any kind of logical or metaphysical rule to say that you could have such a program. But you're, you seem to be implying that because of the conclusion it, it, it leads to, we should kind of go back and then judge that actually that couldn't be programmed in such a way. Well, I, I would say that metaphysically it is impossible because of what I just said about this causal caesura, so to speak, between the states of the lamp in the switching series and the state of the lamp after the switching series is ended. But it's also scientifically impossible as well. Mm -hmm. Nobody has thought there could really be such a thing because once you get down to certain quantum distances, it's impossible to switch the lamp on and off anymore. The thing is purely a thought experiment. It's not meant to be something that's physically realizable. And so this wouldn't have any impact upon contemporary science. Contemporary science has no use whatsoever for the actual infinite. Uh, contemporary science operates purely on the basis of potential infinities.